Thank you all very much. Thank you all for doing this. This is the first time that Michael Linton, the CEO of Sony Entertainment, John Carlin, Assistant Attorney General for National Security, have been public to talk about this. Uh, John was at Aspen this summer talking about it in a smaller group. And uh, I think it's really important to focus on how it happened. It could happen to you. I'm going to start with Michael. You were driving your Volkswagen uh, to work when you got the first word. Tell me Much what happened, reported. what you did. Much reported is, you know, the beginning of, uh, you could only call it, what's the kid's book, Alexander's Really Terrible, Horrible, Horrible Day, or whatever it's called. <laughs> uh, so I got a phone call. I was driving to work, and it was our CFO, and he said, there's been, um, our email is shut down. There seems to be a breach of the system. Mm -hmm. And um, then called me back to say, we've made a decision to come, go offline to pull the plug, so to speak, because we don't want whatever's in our system to be infecting the rest of Sony and our other partners. How quickly did you associate it with the Seth Rogen movie in North Korea? Not, no, at that point, it's, you know, you have no idea what's going on. I didn't even understand what exactly was, we didn't understand the extent of the damage, what had been stolen, any of it, so no. And how long did it take you, how many days to know that this was not just some little hack? Pretty quickly. So what happened then, and that to me was the eye-opener, uh, Nicole Seligman, who works with me in New York, she immediately called into the FBI and knew who to call. Um, and that actually is one of the bigger lessons for me personally, because when one of these things happen, it's not like you can pick up the phone and call the local police department. So John, uh, you're the person you're actually supposed to call and you work with people. Who do you call if something like that happens? So I think an important lesson that Sony did right was within hours they knew who to call. And the reason they knew who to call is they had a pre-existing relationship where a high-level executive knew by name and by face I'm having a, a, a moment where my whole company's reputation is on the line. I have someone in government I've already talked to, I've already thought about what might happen if we had this type of attack, so I know who to call. But what, what does a company out there do now who doesn't have Nicole Seligman who once knew everybody in government? So let's say, go meet your, uh, you can pick your person who you have the trust relationship with. It could be the, the local U.S. attorney in the district where you are. It could be the head of the FBI out there. It could be us back in Washington at the National Security Division. But we've learned we need to be out there talking to you before an event. So in other words, you're going to do an outreach program? So we're starting uh, in the part in large part because of things like Sony. We've started a new outreach program. We're putting a new coordinator in place that we're just uh, announcing today so that all across the country, as part of their job, we're not just prosecuting terrorists. We're not just prosecuting spies and trying to prevent attacks. We are reaching out preventatively to talk to people about here are best practices, here are things you can do, and here's what you should think about before the attack takes place. When Nicole Seligman's call came in to somebody at the U.S. Justice Department, uh, you had been both at the FBI, you've now moved to the Justice Department as Assistant Attorney General. What happened with that call and how quickly was there a response? So literally within hours of the original breach, within the first 24 hours, Sony reached out and at the FBI they uh, had a team go to uh, Sony to assist from uh, the FBI. And let me be clear because I think people have this vision of the FBI comes in and seizes your servers and they're wearing uh, suits and ties and white shirts, which I approve of. We saw of. the movie last <laughs> night and they did wear suits and ties. <laughs> But there's a team, too, you know, that after a while was eating pizza with the, uh, their counterparts at Sony. And, you know, we're dressing down in the sneakers. These are the, the, the cyber gurus. And they're there to, to use an old phrase, they're there to help. Uh, and they very much respect the need of a business to get back to doing what it does, which is providing. So what business. happened uh, at Sony? 20, 30 agents come eventually? We, uh, no, it's exactly Sean described it. About 20 agents showed up. Um, and it's true, they got out of their suits in a hurry, and we provided them with uh, a room, and they worked side by side with our IT folks, um, starting the forensics, trying to understand what had happened, and they pretty much were there for, gosh, at least two months going through the materials, and um, then on top of that, we actually had to reach out to the FBI, and the Justice Department was fantastic in all of this as well, but we had to reach out to the FBI because the, the employee base was really concerned about what was happening with all of the data that had been stolen. And so the FBI came in and we did these uh, 
giant meetings, six, seven hundred people at a time, where the FBI would stand up and explain to them what they could do to protect their identity and make sure that um, you know the thing was sorted out as best it could. Now, what you know, when did you figure out it was North Korea and dealt with the movie? And as you walked the cat back from Rand to the people you'd called at State Department, mm -hmm. was there anything that you should have done differently that people should know about? I don't think so. You know, I mean, we, the only time we really definitively knew that it was North Korea was when the government told us. In the first instance, it was the FBI. When was that? That was... Well, John, when did you, how did you know it was North Korea? So, uh, to build back and, and think, this is a new approach for us. For a long time, you know, I work in a facility where to get in, you need uh, biometric information to my secure facility. We have walls designed so that uh, people cannot eavesdrop on what we're doing. I am not used to, nor are the people in the National Security Division, spending time in the lights. But we've realized as we've switched missions from terrorism, which still is a top priority, preventing an attack, to trying to deal with cyber attacks, we're in a new world where a national security event is North Korea attacking a movie company about a movie. That's not. Had not you ever really prepared for that? We were not focused on. We had started to go in that uh, uh, movie one. We we had started to move to confront the economic espionage threat, which meant reaching out to private. But when we were thinking of a major destructive attack by a rogue nation state, we were not thinking. So when you get so, to the Situation Room and you all have to explain it to the president, what do you say? You know, it was. It, uh, it was an important but somewhat surreal experience where we have the same national security team. We walk into the, uh, the situation room, we sit around the table, and we're, the options we're considering include people having to, you have to describe to folks around the table what the interview is. Right. Um, this, the movie, this, you mean. The, the movie. Movie. And you're explaining <laughs> a Seth Rogen movie to the President of the United States. You, uh, well, I'm not going to talk about the internal deliberation, but you can imagine that the, uh, that would have to be part of it because someone <laughs> needs to know why, why, they do this, uh, why they do this attack. And so how did you know it was North Korea? When did you know and how did you figure it out? So here, and this, this uh, I'll emphasize again, is so important about not hiding that you've been breached, but working with the government. Be it's because Sony worked with us that you had, which really an amazingly quick attribution, 27 days after we got the call, we publicly said that it was the North Koreans. And it was a combination of an analysis of the actual malware, the computer code, which leaves certain signatures, they were sloppy with some of their trade craft, so they'd use a proxy server. Instead of going directly in, they'd use another server to try to hide where they were coming from, but on one or two instances, they did not, so you could see where they were pinging from, and it was a place we knew was North Korea. But also, it was one of the first times the FBI's behavioral analysis unit, the so-called profilers that work on serial killers and uh, rapists, worked on a cyber crime. And in addition to the technical analysis, they looked at prior North Korean attacks, like one on South Korea. They compared the type of messaging that they used, the motive, the intent. In, in murders, they call it staging a scene. So in a murder, they might stage the body in, in a way, and they want to get a maximum reaction out of the person who walks in on that murder scene. With a hack, they stage the hack, so you're seeing certain visuals of a skeleton, and they analyzed that using their psychological training along with their cyber wow. training. And their profilers and all these people, there's a facility somewhere where you and they can watch in real time things happening visually on screens. Explain what you do there and why didn't you notice that they were coming into Sony? Well, I'll tell you a little bit. So we, uh, back when I was at FBI, we started transforming to get better on the intelligence side of the house and watching the cyber threat. And as part of that, the FBI, working with the rest of the intelligence agencies, NSA, CIA, work to map out threats in real time and visualize them. And there's a giant screen, and you could see in real time thousands of attacks occurring on American companies across the nation and watch in real time as the adversary hopped from computer to computer into those systems, and then you'd watch the data getting exfiltrated out. And one thing that helped us prepare for something like Sony is we were good at watching it, but it was horrifying to watch it. And we realized we can't just watch. This isn't an intelligence problem. This is theft. Right. So it was like an incoming missile, and you're kind of watching it, and you don't do anything because we don't have a doctrine yet, but now we're going to have to change that. Yeah, and if you think of it in three buckets, so with the cyber attack, one would be what we saw with Sony, a destructive attack. I think mm -hmm. everyone knew when we start seeing destructive attacks, we need to figure out how to react. 
The second would be traditional intelligence, mm -hmm. and that's the way it was being treated for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. But the third is theft, mm -hmm. and that's not traditional intelligence. They're going after companies to steal intellectual property, to steal negotiation strategies, and use them in business against those companies. And the determination to stop that and impose cost is what led to the indictment of five members of the People's Liberation Army for intruding on a range of American industry, from solar to nuclear to steel, from the management side. They even were stealing from a labor union that was in a, a le mm. legal dispute with them. That's why we decided we need to apply the same type of criminal tools that we do with all other types of theft. And we need to start applying some of the lessons of 9-11. When it comes to terrorism, we never treated it just as intel or law enforcement after 9-11. We made a lot of uh, determined steps to break the wall down between law enforcement and intel. That's why my division was formed. So we had the prosecutors and the intelligence lawyers sitting together. We had not, we're just starting to apply that same approach against the cyber mm. threat. The PLA case was the first time the American government made a determination. One, we're gonna figure out exactly who did it, by name, by face. These are the specific members of the PLA. Two, we're gonna make it public. Right. And three, there's going to be consequences. In that case, a criminal charge. And in Sony, for the first time, you saw the use of an executive order that uh, named North Korea. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, uh, it becomes clear it's North Korea. Yeah. Tell me the damage control and what you were feeling as you walked through this process after one or two days and you realize the seriousness of it. Well, um, first of all, the company is completely shut down. You know, they had destroyed two-thirds of the servers, most of our computers. Obviously, they'd stolen a huge amount of data. Um, and you have um, tremendous un unrest among the folks at the studio because they're obviously really nervous about what's going on. And at the same time, you have a huge and a growing cacophony of noise that's going on with the press as a result of the salacious, e the stolen emails that have start getting published. Tell me if you think the press mishandled uh, printing those emails. I don't think it's correct to be publishing stolen emails, no. And I think, um, you know, I don't think th they were newsworthy and I don't think it's, it's appropriate to be selling, uh, excuse me, publishing stolen emails the way that it happened. And it sort of built on itself, you know, it turned almost into like a riot of of how these emails... You mean the lowest tank of... Uh, well, there used to be this theory, I was just listening to Malcolm Gladwell give a speech on Saturday about how riots occur, and in the 70s, um, uh, a sociologist here at Stanford determined that they aren't just mass actions that in fact, would, you know, that are ideologically based or based on belief yeah. systems. It's sort They're, of one brick. Then one another. person has a lowest threshold and they throw a brick yeah. through a window and then the next person has a slightly higher threshold and pretty soon you get to the 99th person and everybody's throwing bricks. And so that's what sort was of it like? It, it was your cascaded. personal email, some of them deeply personal. What were you feeling and what upset you? Um, not a lot of my personal, personal emails were printed in the press. Uh, obviously, my correspondence was available publicly, um, particularly after Julian Assange decided to WikiLeak it all. Um, the, the, the part that was distressing was the extent to which people had decided to go through it. You know, you'd be sitting there at lunch, and it still happens, and they wander up to your table and say, oh, I just saw, just read through the correspondence you had with so-and-so. That was really interesting. And you're sort of thinking to yourself, really? That, that seems an odd way to spend an afternoon. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so what was... I haven't even been back through any of the WikiLeaks stuff. So, yeah. you know, for somebody else to go back through it. But so it, it, was, it was a very, very chaotic and um, tumultuous period all the way through into February because you had, as I say, a very nervous employee population. You had all of these emails coming out, which made it very noisy from the outside. Obviously, there was... Um, the White House stepped in at a certain point in December, and that, you know, made... Well, wait, tell me, well, how did the White House step in, and why did that cause at first an explosion for you? Well, because there was a fundamental misunderstanding about what had happened in the release pattern of the movie. Mm -hmm. Leading up to the release, um, we rely on the, on the big theater chains to release um, a movie, and when they uh, looked at what was this final email that came through from what we now believe to be or know to be the North Koreans threatening, they made the determination that they were not going to show the movie at that time. And so we decided to recalibrate and rethink how we were going to distribute the picture. And were you upset that the other studios did not stand with you firmly? Um, 
that's a complicated uh, thing. Yes, it would have been better if at the time they had. Not, by the way, to be, uh, to put on a good face to the perpetrator of all of this, but rather because the employee base inside the studio felt very isolated. And to have, you know, other folks reaching in saying, we're with you, obviously makes people feel better for it. And what about um, the distribution outlets who you had trouble saying, hey, we need to get this movie out for... Well, that, you know, we were right in the middle of the Christmas period um, at that point, and we quickly made the determination that we would have to figure out how to get this thing out online. Um, you go to the major uh, either uh, uh, retailers, online retailers, or you go to some of the big cable operators, and they don't want disruption during this critical period. And so you would call folks and they would say, I'm sorry, but we can't take the product right now. And this all happened within a 48 hour time frame. Right and, uh, after the president had sort of done the right, game. No, before the president. So this was all going on. This all happened on the Wednesday and the president came out and spoke on the Friday. Without a heads up and saying, why didn't Michael Linton call me? He said. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I, he, he was, uh, I, uh, he, he, he had his own reasons for saying what he what said. Was that? And, I think he wanted to say to the country that it's not appropriate that um, the United States in any way, shape, or form back down to... Did that change your thinking when... No, the pre no. Our, our thinking was, at, 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 as of Wednesday, we had already started to reach out. And that was the conversation, or the, rather the interview that I had on CNN that day. We had already to started to reach out. Nobody had confirmed. The one company that really immediately stepped up and said, we want to do this, but we have to do some forensics and worked very closely with the FBI was Google. But they didn't confirm that they were going to be able to do it until that weekend. Um, you uh, work for a Japanese com company. Yeah. The Japanese company has a complex relationship with Koreas and North Korea in particular. Yeah. How did that affect you? Well, first of all, they were tremendously supportive, I have to say, throughout. I was on the phone all the time with my boss, Kazurai, as well as with members of the board and the senior management team. But they also, at the same time, had to keep their distance because for Japan, North Korea, much more than here in the United States, Japan is a clear and present danger. It's, you know, there are North Korean citizens walking in, around in Tokyo. There have been incidents of kidnappings coming out of Tokyo. And obviously, they have the capability or may have the capability of, 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 of of attacking Japan. So they, the, the, from their vantage point, it's much more of a danger, uh, or Korea, North Korea rather, is much more. So of a how did that reflect it in their actions and words to you? Well, there wasn't at any time, and nor do I believe it would have been appropriate, an, a public email coming from Tokyo in support. There was plenty of private telephone conversations, but there was none of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, from, so there was a, there was, there was a, there was a, a healthy distance kept. And is it true, Tokyo. would it be fair to say that the Japanese mentality at the top of Sony view of free expression in the First Amendment is different than, say, Seth Rogen's? No. I would say Kazurai, who is uh, uh, very educated in, 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 in the whole concept of the First Amendment, uh, he, he stood by it. A thousand percent. But I would, say, there I would say in Japanese, perhaps in Japanese culture, the notion of First Amendment and freedom of speech is slightly. But wasn't there pressure like, whoa, why are you? No, 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 no. There was never any pressure. There was just from certain folks in Japan, not necessarily at Sony. There was, there was a, there was a note that the the idea of freedom of speech in that particular country is defined slightly differently from the way we define it here in the United Speaking States. Speaking of which, the Japanese foreign minister when commenting on it, refers to Sony as an American company. Well, no. What he said when, I think it was Secretary Kerry who was over at the time, it was right after the president um, issued the executive order, um, he complimented the president for protecting an American company, which I interpreted as, boy, that really is putting yourself at a distance from, you know, Sony. Sony. It was the first time I... Under, I, well, now you work for an American company. Yeah, Congratulations, well, that, after Michael. 13 years, I've, I've woken. No, I work for a Japanese company. <laughs> but I, that was the first, you know, it was a very, in my opinion, clever way of putting a distance. Mm -hmm. So, John, if a missile had hit Sony Entertainment, 
the American doctrine knows how to retaliate. If a terrorist attack had happened, you would know what to do. Did we have a doctrine in place for a cyber attack to hit a private American corporation? That wasn't to steal intellectual property, but it was done as a attack. I, I think we were moving in that direction, which was this uh, new approach of we need to have, we can figure out exactly who did it uh, with high certainty. And secondly, when we do, we need to make that public because we need to start, ha there has to be a response. There needs to be deterrence. Offense in this space way outstrips uh, defense. There's no wall that you can build that's high enough or deep enough to keep a determined nation state out of your internet connected system. So what is deterrence in this case? So I think here we need to look across the rain, full range of legal tools that the government has. So on the extreme end, if it's uh, an attack that causes loss of life, an attack on critical infrastructure, we can't rule out military response. But then we need to look at tools that we've had on the books for years, like using the criminal justice system to identify people and bring criminal charges. We need, and now post Sony, which was a, a, a catalyzing event, we, the, in that case we had an existing executive order that allowed us to sanction the North Koreans because of other North Koreans. Well, what good is sanctioning the North Koreans? We've been sanctioning them for years. That's, uh, with all due respect, not exactly a retaliation. Well, when it comes to uh, North Korea, I think they said there will be some things you see and some things you don't, but they publicly said there are going to be consequences because of this action. But also, we weren't using sanctions just to uh, send a message to the North Koreans. It was important, and part of the thinking was we need to send a message to every other country and every other group that's thinking of using these methods in the future to attack. Are you companies. confident that the retaliation was proportional and strong enough that it will deter another country from ever doing this? Well, I don't think you can. Let's look at deterrence in the criminal justice system. We've been prosecuting murder uh, for since time immemorial. It's not a failure that people still murder but it would be a bad idea to let them get away At with it. At the other extreme, we have deterrence and nuclear weapons and they haven't been used, so, you know. Right, and I don't, I don't think when it comes to this type of attack, the nuclear mm -hmm. Cold War analogy is probably gonna be the one to hold. We're in a different multipolar world where the groups that are using this, there's a wide range of nations, there's a low barrier to get the capability to do a cyber attack, and you're gonna have both nation states, criminal groups, terrorist groups using these same tools. We can learn some of the lessons though, for instance, taking steps to try to keep the, the most damaging tools out of the worst actors, so disrupting, the, for instance, their ability to obtain certain cyber tools by using sanctions, mm. by using Commerce Department authorities. Mm. And we should use civil authorities as well, like the, uh, think about bringing a WTO action if you see a pattern in practice of theft. Yeah, that ain't going to work property. against North Korea. <laughs> Well, North Korea is a, you know, North Korea is a notoriously difficult problem yeah. set throughout the full range, including nuclear. Of Michael, were problems. you satisfied with the response, as far as you know what it was, of the U.S. government to this attack? You mean in terms of how they helped us or what they did? Well, to let's the North start Koreans? with what I meant, which is the retaliation towards North Korea, you know, and then I, get to how they helped To you. John's point, I don't know exactly what the U.S. government did. I, I have to rely on the fact that they took a proportional response. I was told that they did. Uh, and frankly, that isn't really what concerned me. My, what concerned me was the well-being of the employees at Sony. So tell me about how they helped you there and were you Well, there I described fine. earlier what they did. Yeah. I, think, I think on an ongoing basis, though, um, there's, there's, a, there's a big lesson to be learned here. And I think and a lot of people are trying to focus on how to solve that thing. Let me, let me start by saying, we were a very loud canary in the coal mine. Absolutely. If they had hacked uh, General Electric or somebody right. like that and, and published those emails, right? And I don't think the American public would have paid quite the attention that They're they not did. Not quite have, like Amy no. Pascal. So, well, whomever. But so now people have, were, are paying attention. And so what are the questions? So, so one of the questions is, what is the relationship between private enterprise and government in this? First of all, um, when is it that the government, to your point earlier, should or should not warn you that there is the potential of danger? 
Um, the, we put the trailer out on the movie in June. The North Koreans, or what was thought to be the North Koreans, came out and said it would be an act of war if the movie came out, at which point I did speak with people in the State Department and others, and they assured me, and admittedly, this was a new time for them with Kim Jong-un. They didn't realize that he may not quite be who his father was. In fact, he's further than his father. And then there was an article published by David Sanger in September which said that, at, that the NSA was aware of the fact that um, the North Koreans were spear phishing into Sony. Now, they were spear phishing into and, thousands and of companies. And the government did not tell you that? No, but I don't know whether that was because they didn't connect the events in, the, 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 the events in June to that discovery or not, but the point is a different point. Wait, why, why didn't you? I'll tell him. So, uh, not, I, I'll say it's, it is our firm determination to tell private companies when, we're, when, uh, when we discover incidents of intrusions. And I used to prosecute these cases on the criminal side before I went to the national security world. We weren't good at it uh, then. And so I think we've made a lot of improvements in terms of sharing information and not just showing up at the doorstep of a, of a company and saying, you've been hacked, good luck, but giving the texture and the detail with the companies. The hardest place to do that is if the way in which we've learned the information speaking abstractly, is sensitive sources or methods, meaning we've collected the information in a way where if it becomes public that we know it, we're going to lose the ability to have that insight in the future. And I think what the FBI has started to do now is give classified briefings to people who are read in, in other words, who have the clearances in certain sectors. And that's partly because we're doing this outreach, listening to what people have said, and that was one of the, uh, one of the frustrations. So I think we're really improving on that score. I will say, the legislation and framework that allows you to share information in this new area between companies with the government and receive it back is not where it needs to be. And so we hope to see something uh, pass this fall, but we have not updated our laws. And is there a problem, too, that people in this audience who run Silicon Valley companies are reluctant to uh, do things that um, allow greater transparency and that there's an encryption system now, especially in mobile, that you have real trouble dealing with? You know, I think it's something we need to think about. We, at the same time, we're encouraging uh, the use of encryption as best practices for security information when I do outreach and when folks from our office uh, do it. But we need to be uh, in a place where you have a relationship of trust mm -hmm. with someone in your government when you are the victim. And one of the things I thought was terrible about Sony, and hopefully it was a wake-up call, and I like the name of this panel, it could happen uh, yeah, to, to you, you, which was people thought, no, it can't, there, it, Sony is the bad guy in this because they got hacked. And that's crazy. We don't have that any You had that used to prosecute domestic abuse. and you was Used to do domestic violence, and there was the mentality for a while that blame it's your, the victim. The blame the Did victim. you feel blame the victim while you were doing, people saying, how come you didn't have, you know, this type of firewall or this type of noticing the, that the only real. time that it, you know first of all you don't want to sit there and be a complainer and a whinger particularly when you're just trying to get through it and and as i keep saying the fbi and the and department of justice were fantastic partners in this the only time where you sort of feel it is when people are saying things like there was you know insufficient security or you should have known this was coming when in point of fact we you know we know at, at for a fact that we had as yeah good security as you could have. We did all the work prior to releasing the picture to know that, you know, whether it was a reach out to the State Department or whatever, to, to, to try and understand what the possible risks were. Would it Nobody... you? You have OSHA rules if you have a uh, movie. Well, but that's a different issue. Think... So the, oh, the, that's the other part to where I think the but government... Maybe shouldn't is... the government tell you, here are the rules you got to do on cyber? Y y well, it's, it's, it's such a, a fluid thing, but at, at some level. So now what happens, and I'm sure people in this room, and I know other colleagues of mine have had this experience. So the consultants come in, and they tell you, OK, here's what you can do. And, and it's basically how long is a piece of string. So at the one end, you have the Department of Defense, and they spend, obviously, more money than any private company can afford. Mm -hmm. And then you have Goldman Sachs, and they are defending their systems with I don't even know how much money. And on the other end, you have the, the dry cleaner down the block who's not, you know, presumably doing much. And we, we a company our size, uh, we do about 11 billion in volume, are somewhere in the middle. But 
were I to, for example, be in a manufacturing concern and I had factories, I know from OSHA rules that the staircases have to be a certain way, that if I'm manufacturing something with a certain chemical base, I have to have a shower every so many hundred meters that in case somebody gets asked. There isn't any standard set. So mm -hmm. when the consultants come in and tell you, here's what you need to protect yourself, there's nothing you can measure it against that's coming from the government. And to me, I understand the issue because we're in a very fluid period where it's changing all the time, but that presents a problem. Um, sh how should people, should you do a hack back? So, uh, hack I back. I want to do that. <laughs> Get ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, so the hack back idea would be the idea that the company on its own launches an attack back at the person or person they think attacked their system. No, I don't think that's a great, <laughs> uh, a great idea for a variety of reasons. And having talked to, uh, part of my role is to talk to the general counsels. I don't think there's a general counsel out there who would advise that you do that or a law firm. But that doesn't mean you can't do what's called active defense. So again, go from the premise that a bad guy, particularly a nation state, who is determined to get into your system is getting in. So they can get in. So then what can you do to make their lives as difficult as possible and protect what you value the most inside your system? That's that risk mitigation plan. And that's why it's hard to have a cookie cutter standard because it really depends on your business. But part of that plan can be, for instance, a lot of people out there, I won't ask for a show of hands, but you put what you value most essentially in a folder that's called crown jewels. Yeah. That's not a good idea if the premise is a determined bad guy can get in your Well, what, could you have something called crown jewels and put a whole lot of malware in it so if somebody hacks in, it hurts them? Is that a good idea? So I think if it was malware, again, you'd have this risk of what unintended consequences did I cause that might have liability for your company. But what you could do is put information in there that looks like it's going to work, but won't. Is so disinformation, the, flack, in other words, a movie people download it and it turns out to be flack if not destructive. It's a, or a complete fake. Uh, complete Including fake social man. security <laughs> numbers of all your people that's totally fake, that sort of thing? Or if it's intellectual property, a plan that if they pour money into the R&D when it, when it reaches development, it's not going to work. And yeah. so that's the type of thing where we've also, there might be liability concerns. We've worked with specific companies, uh, FBI, others, to help you come up with that type of False Action and other plan. disinformation that becomes. And, and, and finally, what have you? Sorry? With, we've done that for years with spies. I know many of you saw that uh, premiere, oh, yeah, premiere uh, last night. But this is not new in the world of espionage. What we haven't done is start applying it when it comes to these cyber uh, risks. What new things are you doing? Uh, for the audience. Well, the two basic things we've been doing is, you know, as 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 I said earlier, we we I, I think we had we had absolutely the right security before. Nobody could have withstood, and John could tell you that, the attack of a nation state, we have now, as has everybody else, I suspect, Im improved upon that security. And also, you, you, you make a, a greater evaluation or a more detailed evaluation of what is or is not on the network. That is, that is actually, in my mind, the key thing. Turn up the lights. Let's get a couple of questions, if we can. Uh, yes, sir. Michael, one thing I never understood is once those uh, Amy Pascal and Scott Rudin emails became public, why didn't you fire her earlier? Why did you not fire Amy earlier? Amy was not, uh, did not leave the company because of those emails, so the two are not related to one another. Um, I can understand that people were very upset about those emails, um, but that was not the reason why Amy left the company. Why did you leave? She left the company because at that point, after all that we had been through, it felt like it was the best thing for both she and the company to part ways and for her to become a producer there. But it was not a result of those emails. Why not? Why not? Um, I think those were private email correspondences between the two of them. Um, I think both parties apologized profusely for what they had said. Um, and they felt that they were taken out of context. And um, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know that there's much more right. to be said on the subject. Jody Westby, Global Cyber Risk. So, um, could you speak up a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Lynch, it's nice you're opening this. John up. Carlin, I assume. Pardon? Uh, John Carlin, you're yeah. Pardon? Oh, you said Mr. Linton. 
No. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Who are you addressing it to? Uh, the DOJ man. Okay. John Carlin. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're opening this office to help with assistance for in investigations. And it's great that we have the FBI and the Secret Service, but what the reality is, companies can't hardly get anyone to call them back when there is a major incident because you're too busy. And most metropolitan police departments don't even have a cyber unit. It's trained well enough to respond. And the dollar limit is really going to be a big factor, whether FBI gets involved or not, or Secret Service. And then when you get into international cooperation, it's very difficult to investigate and track and trace these invest these. So crimes. what are you doing to remedy and that, Don? So wait, I that's not the question, Walter. Okay. Well, why don't you get so, to the question, if so you would, please? The question is this. We have the headlines saying, oh, we should slap sanctions on company, countries that, or companies that have cyber crimes. And yet, repeatedly, and Walter hit it with, why didn't you warn Sony? So there's signals intelligence out there to warn these U.S. companies. If slapping French companies, Israeli companies, Russian companies, Chinese companies, we only focus on China, is not the answer. Why aren't we helping our companies? Why aren't we getting cybercrime units trained? Why aren't we telling them information? You don't need Congress to Okay, why don't we let John answer those questions? Yeah, so um, I, I think I start with, I, I agree. We need to do, uh, we need to work harder, faster, to do more, to um, put more resources into the investigators that work on these cases, including training our partners in state and local uh, law enforcement, creating cyber task force the way we have joint terrorism task forces, getting best, better at sharing information quickly with companies, doing outreach uh, in this space, and reaching C-suites so that, especially the Fortune 100, Fortune 500, it's not something that's delegated to the tech expert, but it's someone who thinks about the entire strategy. But I don't think it's an either or. At the end of the day, we're not going to, uh, there's no unfortunately magic defense. So we're going to need to do things that increase the cost to the bad guy, as we have with every other uh, area in both the criminal and national security space. And look, as a country, think about it. About 25, 30 years ago, uh, according to one study, about 98% of what we valued we put in analog form, mm -hmm. papers, et cetera. We've switched to say about 97% of what we value is now in digital space connected to the internet. That took enormous ingenuity, it took an enormous expenditures and time to build that system, and we did not invest at the same time on security. And now on both the private community and the government, we're in a race to catch up before there's a cataclysmic event that takes advantage of the fact we put stuff we valued in an unsecured But space. to get right to the point of the good question, are you getting more resources now so that you, uh, when you created this outreach program, is it funded? So, uh, no, uh, we have more resources in the president's budget, uh, in the proposed budget for our division. I, I instead have taken this quote out of hide to put resources against cyber. FBI has similarly put additional resources, but uh, we hope when the budget gets passed that in and it- And if the budget does not answer. get passed, which is a high probability, is that really bad for our cyber security? It's, it's long term, we have to invest more. I don't think there's another way to do it to improve our ability on cyber security. Hi, Walter, Josh Adler from hey, Sourcewater. Yeah. Uh, First, I want to say, like every patriotic American Jew, I did my duty this Christmas day and <laughs> rented and watched the interview. Thank you. <laughs> because if I didn't, the terrorists win. <laughs> and along those lines, I want to ask, did this cyber attack have its intended policy consequence in quashing or working to chill uh, private free media in, in the U.S. and other Western countries uh, that would otherwise produce shows that mock tyrants? Michael? I don't think that it did. I, 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 mm -hmm. in, I haven't, first of all, I haven't seen any evidence of that whatsoever in, in terms of the development that's going on at our studio, but pretty, I, I know quite a bit of what's going on at the develop, both in television and in film, so I, let, let's speak to that as opposed to reporting. Um, and I've, and I've seen plenty of shows that have mocked um, uh, 
various political leaders outside the United States. So I don't think that it has. You could make an argument the other way, that actually it's, it's, it's emboldened people to, to go out there and, and, and do it just to do for the same reason that you watch the interview on Christmas Day. So I have not seen evidence of that, frankly. Um, and so let me wrap up with a, something building on that question, which is do either or both of you feel that it's now the role of the U.S. government to protect private industry when it comes to things like free expression? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, we were always dead set on releasing the movie. We, we thankfully found fantastic partners in, in Google and, and ultimately Microsoft to help us do it on the day, and as well as we released it ourselves. But when you're up against, and John can speak to this better than I can, when you're up against a, a nation state who's hell-bent on doing what, what they've decided to do, you really have to rely on the U.S. government to be by your side, because if they're not there, you certainly, no matter how big a company you are, you can't do it on your own. I totally agree, and I think if Michael can attest, one le lesson here was in the beginning, in that 27-day period, much of the focus, again, was on Sony and its security. Once we said it was North Korean, rightly so, the narrative changed, and it became, hey, government, what are you doing about it? You're supposed to protect us from things like rogue nation states. That's not up to each company. So even in the space where we need the private sector that owns so much of the infrastructure to take certain measures on its own and do its own investments, when it comes to defending yourself against a nation state or a terrorist group as they work to develop this capability, that has to be a fundamental responsibility in government and we should be held to it. Let me end by saying something personal, if I may. First of all, I want to congratulate you, John. It was interesting getting to know you over the past year. Thank you for what you're doing. But I want to say something personal about Michael, who I've known for a very long time. Uh, and even at Thanksgiving, when this was breaking, we were spending Thanksgiving together. Your leadership, your calm, your moral wow. compass, your ability to handle a lot when people were losing their heads, and your incisive leadership will be a business school case study. And I really congratulate you on leading based on values. And I think you did a really great job leading Sony through this. Thank well, you, thank Michael. Well, thank you. Great people work. Thank you very much, Walter. Sure. I'm free to say. Thank you all. Thank you, John.